You know, sometimes as standards start to be ignored or as standards start to be uh, changed in some ways, well, sometimes we look for a change in the rules as well. What does that mean? When I played basketball, you were allowed two steps when you were going for a layup. Anybody else have two-step rule? That if you were going for a layup, you were allowed two steps when you were going for the layup. And Jonah, if you made three steps, what was that called? Foul. That's a foul. That's traveling. That's when, the, that's when the referee's supposed to blow his whistle, Johnny. You blow the whistle if you take three steps because you've traveled when you've taken three or more steps because you're only supposed to take two steps. Have you watched the NBA? They like walk half the court before they get to the, get to the uh, put the layup in. But have you noticed that they don't call the foul? They don't call them for traveling. Why not? Well, because it's entertaining. Why, why not? Because the standards apparently in the NBA aren't the same as they are in Little League, right? They're not the same as they are in high school. That, you know, those standards change, and so we kind of lax up. We kind of let, let off a little bit, and we say that's not such a big deal anymore. I wonder how many of those things could be said to be true even in the realm of religion, even in the realm of Christianity, where, I, where our society has gone lax on the standards, where our society has backed off and said, wait a minute, that's not such a big deal anymore, and so anything goes. Have you seen that to be the case in our society today, where just about anything goes because we've let off of those standards that we once had? I believe that's the case when it comes to marriage. Of all the things we could talk about, I believe that's the case when it comes to marriage. In our society where marriage used to be held in honor, Hebrews 13, verse 4, where, our mar where, our, where marriage used to be respected, and even you could turn on television in decades gone by and see a husband and a wife who were in a, were, who were in a exclusive relationship with each other, and that was held in honor. That's not held in so much honor anymore today. How many husbands and wives do you see held in honor on television and in the movies today because they're involved in an exclusive God-fearing relationship? Not very many. In fact, they're pointed at and they're laughed at more often than not. And so those standards that our society once lived by are no longer there. And so what's happened? Our society has let up and almost said anything goes. And so a few months ago, we started a series on Sunday nights, just looking at what God says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And we've, we've dropped one of these lessons about every four to six or seven weeks on a Sunday night as we've gone back and tried to look at what does the Bible say about this topic. Not what does our society think about it. We already know what they think about it. What does the Bible say about it? Because the last time I checked, the rule was still... Two steps are okay when making a layup, but three steps is traveling. Last time I checked, that was still the rule, no matter how much we've let off of it. And last time I checked, the laws that God lays down about marriage, divorce, and remarriage in His Word are still there. And they still apply even if man doesn't want to follow them anymore, even if man has backed away from them. And so we, uh, uh, I don't remember how many weeks ago, sometime I think at the end of May, we had a lesson on just God's overview of this particular topic. This is about our fourth lesson in this particular series, looking at this topic. But we talked about just an overview. Now, we're going to get into more specifics. We're going to talk about some things tonight in an overview way that we're going to get into more specifics as, as the months go on on these, uh, on these Sunday nights. But we just kind of, what, let's look at an overview. And so what we talked about uh, a few weeks ago is just an overview of marriage. How, how does God look at marriage? What does God say about marriage uh, in Scripture? Uh, but we held the second part of this particular lesson until tonight to talk about that was God's overview of marriage. Just in a scriptural sense, what is God's overview of divorce? What does God think of divorce? I think I said this in every other lesson, or at least I intended to say this in every other lesson. These lessons are not targeted at anybody. These lessons are not being put together because they're being focused on any one particular person and we want one somebody to hear what this has to say. These lessons are for all of us. We all need a reminder 
of just what God says about this topic. For some of us, this is going to hit a lot closer to home than for others. But for all of us, we need to understand where God stands on these things. So whether it applies to us, whether it applies to somebody in our family, or whether it's our friends, or just our understanding of these things in general, we need to be reminded of these things. So that as our society continues to steer further and further away from God's Word, we can continue to stand firmly where God wants us to stand. The Bible tells us that marriage is a divine institution. What does that mean? The Bible tells us that God created marriage in Genesis chapter 2. And God's design for marriage never changed. Can you hear me on that? God created in marriage, marriage, uh, God created marriage in Genesis chapter 2. And God's will was for that to never change. Not ever. We read about a concession that was made during a period of hardness of hearts in the book of Deuteronomy. But that was not a command of God. So God created marriage in Genesis 2 and he regulates marriage in the rest of his word. And so what we talked about a few months ago, and we're not going to detail all of these again, but we talked about God's overview of marriage, that God and his word has a plan for marriage. He'd identified the participants uh, that he wants in marriage, that he gives a priority uh, to marriage, that he has the provisos, he's got the regulations for how this is to be done inside of marriage. He tells us what the purpose of marriage is but it's God who gives a permanence to marriage. It's Jesus coming along and Jesus saying, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And so for just a few minutes tonight, I want us to talk about a topic that I know is not easy, not comfortable to talk about, but just an overview. We're going to, get in, we're going to take some of these particular things and we're going to spend more time in later months talking about some of these in particular because there are some passages where man has really done some things that, that have twisted some things that Scripture says. But we're just trying to get an overview tonight. What does the Bible say about divorce? I know Greek words are not our favorite thing to talk about and no doubt they don't need to be talked about too much in, in lessons. But I'm going to share some Greek words with you tonight just so that we can back up to that original text and see what are we talking about. Because when we use the word divorce, understand that some translations don't have the word divorce. The word divorce comes from the Greek word apoluo. And that means nothing. It doesn't mean, the Greek word doesn't need to mean a whole lot. It takes the word luo, which is a word that means loose, and it puts the prefix from in front of it and talks about being loosed from. And so you see what the word means. It means to be set free. It means to be released, to send away. Uh, and so the word that we have in English that's, that is translated comes from this Greek word apoluo. And I like the American standard that was translated in 1901 the best because it translates this Greek word not as divorce, but it translates it as put away. And I think that helps us to come to an understanding of what God is trying to tell us what he means by divorce. Because when we hear divorce, we have what we think divorce is. We have what we've heard divorce is. We think about the court system. We think about the paperwork. We think about all of these things that are involved in divorce. But if we hear the word put away, that's what it means. If we hear the word put away, okay, wait a minute. That gives a different understanding than just the word divorce. And the word put away gives us that God's understanding of divorce, it, it involves a mental act, meaning it's a choice. It is a decision that I make. It is an intentional act, meaning it's not something that I do accidentally. It's something that I've thought about, that I've thought through, and that I am going to do. I don't have the word up here, but it is a communicated act, that I communicate this is going to be done, and then there is the legal part of it. Sometimes we only look at the legal part of it. We say, well, that's what divorce is. But God says, no, 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 no. The divorce is the whole putting away process. And so sometimes if you're doing some reading or studying on this, you will, you will hear some individuals talking about whether they have put away their spouse. And that's got, that is taking that word and helping us to see that it's not just this legal side that we think about it. There's this whole process that starts with me thinking about it, me deciding to do it, me intending to do it, me communicating to do it, and then I go through whatever legal process there is in whatever country I live in. Now, marriage, we know, involves three parties. Now, I know that sounds weird to some people. 
But marriage involves three parties. You got the man and you got the woman. One man, one woman, and you've got God. How often are marriages started today where the man and the woman don't realize that there is somebody else that is to be involved in their marriage? Marriage involves three parties. It involves man, it involves God, uh, man and woman, and it involves God. And so if marriage involves more than two parties, would divorce involve more than two parties? If marriages that are acceptable to God involve more than two parties, there's a man and a woman and there's God, then would divorce also involve more than just those two parties? What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that if God is the one that Jesus says is joining two people together, and if that's the only acceptable way for someone to be married is for God to join them together, then how can someone get a divorce acceptable in the eyes of God unless God is involved in that as well? And so I have up here the word disjoin, and it's obviously in quotation marks to mean this is a word that's being made up here uh, in, in this situation. But if God is supposed to be the one joining two people together, then would God be left out of the equation when two people get involved in putting each other away? I just want you to let that settle down, resonate, think about if I'm going to put away my spouse, am I doing that outside of or without God's approval, without God's involvement in this? You see, when we talk about marriage, God's plan for marriage, as I stated, has been the same all the way from the beginning. You go back to the beginning, and it never changed. God's design for marriage is back in Genesis 2 and verse 27, where God said, A man shall leave his father and mother, shall be joined, shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Where does that verse talk about divorce? Genesis 2. It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help me comparable to him. He makes the woman. He brings the woman to the man. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. God marries them together. Where do you read about divorce in Genesis chapter 2? You don't. Where do you read about divorce in Genesis chapter 3? Where do you read about divorce in Genesis chapter 4? I won't take the time to go all the way through to Genesis chapter 50, but I could. And the answer would be the very same for every single chapter in the book of Genesis. Where do you read about divorce in the book of Genesis? You don't read about it. The book of Genesis, uh, chronologically, historically, covers the most time uh, in all of the books of the Bible. The book of Genesis covers 2,500 years of biblical history. And so in 25 years, the first 2,500 years of biblical history, we don't read about divorce. From God what does that tell us about God's plan what does that tell us about God's design for marriage he didn't want divorce from the very beginning it was not a part of his plan and you know when you fast forward all the way to the end of the book the end of the Old Testament before the Old Testament closes God says I have one more thing to say about putting away the old American standard has putting away here. I have one more thing to say about putting away your spouse. And God says, it's something that he hates. So when we're looking at just an overview, what does the Bible teach us about divorce? It's something that God did not include. It is something that God did not intend from the very beginning. So it is something that man has brought into the equation. So let that settle for a minute. It's not something that God commanded. It's not something that God wanted. So where did it come from? It's something that man brought into the equation in marriage. And so that's why when you read in Deuteronomy chapter 24 that God made a temporary concession, permission for a period of time, but Jesus says it was because of the hardness of their hearts. It was not a part of God's original plan. It's not what he wanted. But we live in a society today. We live in a society that has very different ideas than what God has. And so what we need to be reminded of tonight is that God's marriage laws are not bound to or bound by 
what man thinks. Man might approve of something. Man might even legislate something. But that does not mean that God's laws are, are somehow bound or loosed by whatever man thinks. God's laws are never subject to. They're never subservient to man's laws. Which, is that true? In, in Acts chapter 5, when, when uh, man's laws were telling the apostles, stop preaching about Jesus. Man's laws were saying, we command you, we, we threaten you, don't preach about Jesus. Did the apostles say, we must obey the law of the land? Is that what they said? No. Acts 5 and verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than man. Now, where, where man's law does not contradict God's law, then we are to submit ourselves. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13 says we are to submit ourselves uh, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, to every human ordinance, uh, to, to the governing authorities. We are to submit ourselves. Romans 13 tells us that we are to obey our governing authorities, but not when they violate what God says. Not when they turn against what God says. And so man's laws have no power to sanction something that God says is wrong. It does not matter what the Supreme Court decides about marriage. It doesn't change what the Supreme Court says about marriage. It doesn't matter what is accepted in our society. It doesn't matter what man forbids in our society if God has deemed something to be right in his sight. And oh, how we need to be reminded of that because society will change. You, you, you think, about, think about where our society is today in 2023 compared to where it was 50 years ago on marriage. Has it changed in the last 50 years? It's like been flipped over on its head, right? Okay, if the Lord allows the earth to stand for another 50 years, you think it's going to get better? You think it's going to come back right side up again? Or do you think it's going to get flipped even more? We need to understand that no matter how much things change, God's law never changes. God's law remains constant. We can always come back to it and trust it every single time that no matter what society thinks, God's law doesn't change. And so if civil law joins two people together, if civil law, you go down to the court and you get married and the justice, of the, uh, the justice of the peace pronounces you husband and wife, does that mean that God has joined those two people together? Just because civil law has bound two people together, does that mean that God has bound them? Just because something is legal, does that necessarily make it scriptural? Go to Mark chapter 6 in your Bible, and I know you know this passage, but I want you to see it. Look at Mark chapter 6. You're reading about two Bible characters in Mark chapter 6. You're reading about a man by the name of Herod. This is Herod Antipas, and you might even write uh, in your Bible next to this uh, in Mark chapter 6, and uh, starting back in verse 14 where it talks about King Herod. This is, King, this is Herod Antipas. He is the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was in Matthew chapter 2 trying to kill uh, infant Jesus, killed those, who were, those infants who were two years old and under. So that's Herod the Great. One of his sons is named Herod Antipas, who is here, and he kills John the Baptist. So Herod Antipas, prior to what we're reading here, Mark chapter 6 and, and beginning in verse 14, prior to this time, he had been married to, history tells us, he had been married to the daughter of an Arabian king. So Herod Antipas had already been married. He had been married to the daughter of an Arabian king, but he had divorced her in order to come over here and marry Herodias. Well, who's Herodias? Herodias is the daughter of Aristobulus, who was another one of the sons of Herod the Great. So Herod Antipas divorced his first wife to marry his niece, Herodias. Well, but she had been married before too. She had been married to Philip I, who was also a son of of Herod the Great, and now she had been married to her uncle, Herod, Her, Her, the, Her, uh, not Herod, been married to her uncle, Philip I, divorced him in order that she might marry her other uncle, Herod Antipas. Is that confusing? You want a chart about this? You want to write down the names and draw circles so you know where everybody fits on this chart? Mark chapter 6, verse 16. 
Herod realized this is John, or thought about, heard about Jesus, said, wait a minute, this is John whom I beheaded. He's been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John. And he bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Except, wait a minute, she wasn't anymore brother Philip's wife because they had been married, but they had now been divorced because now Herod and Herodias are married. And that's why John comes to Herod in verse 18 and says, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. It's not lawful. What law had Herodias and Herodias? What law had Herod and Herodias violated? Had they violated Roman law? Had they broken the Roman law? Were they going to be taken to prison because they broke the Roman law? John the Baptist is not talking about Roman law. He's talking about divine law. Here were two people who were married to each other. They had been married to other people, but now they're married to each other. And John comes along and, and he keeps saying over and over, not just one time, it is not lawful for you to have her. Why is it not lawful? Because God says it. You see, civil law is not subject, it, God's law is not subject to civil law. If God's law says you don't have a right to be married, it does not matter what civil law says. And if in civil law, if that joins two people together and that doesn't necessarily mean they're married in the eyes of God, then what about two people civilly in civil law getting a divorce from each other? Does that mean? Does that mean that they are divorced from each other in the eyes of God because God has, God has no longer bound them? That, that should have been up there already. That God, God already sees them as divorced just because a, a, uh, a court system sees somebody as being divorced just because a nation sees somebody as being divorced? Does that mean that they are divorced in the eyes of God? How can that be if there are some people that God does not even see have the right to be married to each other? We need to make a distinction between what God's law says and what civil law says. Isn't that what we talked about this morning, talking about the difference between truth and error and making that distinction? We've got to do it on this subject and make sure we understand what, what does God authorize and understand how that is different from what man authorizes. Just because, just because man might be okay with a certain marriage doesn't mean that God is. Just because man might be okay with a certain divorce does not mean that God is. And if you say, wait a minute, I don't know that I can draw that line. I don't know that it's right for us to draw that line. Well, where are you not willing to draw a line? If two men go and get married and you say, that's none of my business, I can't say whether that's right or wrong. They've got a right, they have a right, they have a right to do that. Who gave them that right? Two men getting married to each other is not right in the eyes of God. It is not lawful for them to be together in the eyes of God. And you take that and you take it out to the nth degree to the thing that makes you the most uncomfortable with somebody marrying somebody else or something else. You take it out to the nth degree as far as you want and say, where are you going to draw the line as to what's right and what's wrong? What we need to do is to, is to make sure that we come and just draw the line where God draws the line. So here's God's general rule when it comes to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. You're in Mark chapter 6. Flip over to chapter 10. Look at the passage that was read in Mark chapter 10. And here's God's general law, God's general rule when it comes to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Starting in verse 10. The disciples took Jesus when they came into the house and they asked him again about the same matter. If you had just heard Jesus talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, would you want to ask him some questions too? And so Jesus says in verse 11, whoever divorces his wife and marries another person commits adultery against her. 
And if you need a passage that's going to help you to understand that this applies not just to a man who divorces his wife, but also to a woman who divorces her husband, here's the passage you need to come to. Because Jesus says it's not just about a man who divorces his wife, verse 12, but if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Stop and let those verses sink in. Because if we had no other verses, if we had no exceptions given to us, Anywhere else in Scripture, this would be God's universal and perpetual law concerning marriage. Whoever divorces their spouse and marries somebody else commits adultery. That is God's underlying rule regarding marriage. How long has He had that rule? All the way from the very beginning. Look over in Romans chapter 7. Keep your Bibles, keep your Bibles open. We're going to go to Romans 7, and then very quickly we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look in Romans chapter 7. Marriage is not Paul's point. It's not his purpose. He's using it as an illustration in Romans chapter 7. And so in Romans 7 and verse 2, and we're going to come back and look at this text more, more deeply in a further lesson. But in Romans 7 and verse 2, he says, For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. That's an interesting expression. If he dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, while he's still alive, if she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. What's God's law? God's law is marriage is for life. If someone divorces their spouse and marries another, they are committing adultery. Romans chapter, 10, Romans chapter 7, a, a man or a, and a woman are bound to each other. How long? As long as they live. And so if they go and marry someone else, God says they're going to be called an adulterer. They're going to be called an adulteress. That's God's law. Not, not my law. It's not David's law. It's not the church's law. It's God's law. This isn't some ordinance of man. It's not some ordinance of the church. There are no such things. This is an ordinance of God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And again, we're going to come back and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 more in depth uh, in a future lesson because it's a, key, it's a key chapter that we've got to have in this particular study. But look in Romans, or 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 10. Now to the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord, Paul says, a wife is not to depart from her husband. Well, what if she does? What if she does depart? Paul says she has two options. If she does depart, she is to remain unmarried, or the other option is to be reconciled to her husband. Well, what if she wants to get married to somebody else? What does Romans chapter 7 say? She marries somebody else while her husband still lives. She shall be called an adulteress. And this doesn't just apply to the wife. The end of verse 11 says, And a husband is not to divorce his wife. What is God's overriding law? What's his overriding rule? Is that marriage is for life and God does not want a man and a woman to divorce. And if their spouse dies, verse 39 says, a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. As you read through these, you cannot, be, you cannot help but be impressed by God's original plan for marriage, that it is a lifelong commitment that he hates putting away. And in God's eyes, a second marriage, going outside of the first one and going and getting involved in a second marriage is not acceptable in his eyes and therefore is sinful. You want to talk about something that is about the most unpopular thing you could teach today? This is right at the top of the list, isn't it? What in the world does this guy think he's doing? Standing up there saying this kind of stuff. Nobody believes this anymore. Does that matter? Does it matter that nobody believes this anymore? And yet, think about what Jesus does in Matthew chapter 19. If we did not have Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, and if we did not have Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, this is all that we would have. And there would not be anything else for us to know. And yet in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, Jesus gives the one and only divine exception 
to everything else that's on the screen. When Jesus says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. If Jesus had not put in except for fornication, there would not be any exceptions. And the word exception, as we'll talk about in a future lesson, we'll look at this text more in depth in a future lesson. It means if and only if. This is the only exception that God has in play for someone to divorce and to therefore in his eyes marry someone else is if that sexual union that is only to be between a husband and wife and that's taken outside of the marriage, then you can put away your spouse because of what they have done and marry someone else without committing adultery. And that is the only exception he gives. Could God's, I, would, can God's law for marriage be any different than man's idea for marriage? Could they be any different? So different, and yet where do we need to stand? We need to stand where God stands. Let me share with you very quickly a couple other definitions that are important in this subject. And we'll go into these more in depth in, in, in future lessons, but I just want to drop these here. Important definitions. When Jesus says, except it be for fornication in Matthew 19, what is that? One of the questions I get, maybe more than others, but it's, 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 it's frequently given, this may not be the most but one of the questions I get a lot is, why did Jesus use the word fornication in Matthew 19? Why did Jesus say, whoever divorces his wife except it be for adultery and marries another commits adultery? Why did he use the word fornication? Because if you were to draw a large circle on a piece of paper and say, this is fornication, this, this representation of a large circle is fornication, the word fornication is, de is defined by God as a broad term that involves all illicit sexual intercourse. It comes from the Greek word porneia, and I know we don't want to often think about Greek words, but that Greek word is important because that Greek word is defined as every kind of unlawful sexual activity. Every kind. Well, Jesus, why didn't you use, use the word adultery? Because if you go and have sex with somebody outside of marriage, that's adultery. Why do you use the more broad term of fornication? But it, because it, uh, this is David's opinion, he doesn't get, Jesus doesn't tell us why he does it. Here's David's opinion on it, because the word fornication includes every possible unlawful sexual activity, intercourse that you can imagine. Does it include sex before marriage, where some people want to, some people want to limit this to sex before marriage? Certainly, it includes that. Does it include sex between people who are not married to each other? Certainly includes that. Does it include sex between somebody who is married uh, to somebody else uh, with somebody that they're not married to and that's who they're having sex with? Yes, it includes that. But fornication also includes homosexuality, includes bestiality, includes incest. It includes every kind of unlawful sexual intercourse that you can think of. If Jesus had just said and used the word adultery in this large circle that you've drawn and said, label this as fornication, inside the large circle is a smaller circle that's called adultery and another smaller circle that's called fornication and another smaller circle that's called bestiality. But Jesus didn't pick one type of fornication. He chose the whole category. And he said, it doesn't matter what kind of sexual intercourse it is, with who or with what, if somebody commits that against their spouse, that's taking what God has given outside of marriage. We need to see what this word means. Now, does it include pornography? It does not. Does it include a man looking at pornography? It does not. Because what is the word? The word means having sexual intercourse with a person. And that is not pornography. We'll come back and talk about that more. We'll just let that sit there. What about the word adultery? We've already talked about this. That adultery is a smaller category within the larger category of fornication. It is a specific type of fornication. It comes from the Greek word morkeia that, that specifically means that this is unlawful sexual activity that's, that's taking place between two people, one of whom is married to somebody else. But look at the definition. It is unlawful sexual intercourse. We'll talk more about this in a future lesson. It is not the marriage. 
Some people say, well, they got married to somebody else, and that's the adultery. But they can stay married because the adultery was only the getting married. What is adultery? It is sexual intercourse. It's not getting married. Well, it's just the marriage. It's, it's the marriage act. It's the ceremony. It's the getting of the, the marital certificate. That's what the adultery is, but they can stay married. No. What does the, you, you have to look at words and what they mean, not what we want them to mean. And, and so they, they want it to mean it's just that act, but they can stay married. Adultery is something that a person can, it is a sin that a person can live in perpetually. Not just a one-time act. It is a sin, and read, read passages, read Galatians 5, read 1 Corinthians 6 about these sins that are not just a one-time thing, but when somebody married, what did Jesus say? Matthew 19, whoever, Mark chapter 10, whoever divorces their spouse and marries another commits. You hear the S on that? Look at the King James, committeth, present tense. It's an ongoing sin, not a one-time sin. It's an ongoing sin that's involved in that marriage that is adulterous in the eyes of God, not just a one-time act. What about the word repentance? Some people want to redefine what repentance is. The word repentance means a change of mind that leads to a change of conduct. Some people want to redefine repentance as, well, this per they, they feel really bad about what they did. They feel sorry that they got married, and they realize they should not have done that, but they can stay married to them. Repentance is not feeling sorry that I did something. Repentance is what happens after I feel sorry for doing something. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 says, godly sorrow produces repentance. The sorrow that I did something produces repentance that is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. So what is repentance? Repentance involves when I change my mind because I've realized I've done something wrong. I have a sorrow for sin. I change my mind about what I'm doing like that man did in Matthew chapter 21 where his father said, go out to the vineyard and work. And he said, I will not. And then he repented and he went and worked. He changed his mind about what his dad said. He said, nope, I need to go and do it. And then it is followed by a change of action. Those who want to say they can just stay in that marriage, be, you know, they feel bad, they, they've committed, they will never do that sin again, and they can stay in that marriage. That is redefining repentance to something the Bible does not define repentance as. Repentance is a change of mind, that leads to changing whatever I need to do to get back in a right relationship. We'll talk more about this in a future lesson, but let me ask you this. If repentance is only, I feel bad, I promise I'll never do this again, but they can stay in that marriage, then what about two men who get married? Can they learn the truth that they're not supposed to be married and say, you know what, I feel bad that I did this, I shouldn't be married to this person, but then stay married? To that person? No. It's still sinful in the eyes of God. And I don't get to stay in something just because I have felt bad that I am there. It requires making whatever changes are necessary. I realize this is a lot of information to take in. I said this was an overview and now we've, we've given a lot of information about divorce and fornication and adultery and repentance. But let me ask you to turn to one last passage and then we're done. Go to Matthew chapter 19. We live in a day and age of disposable marriages where today you can get divorced for any reason. And so for somebody to hear a lesson like this one tonight sounds overly harsh. It sounds really unpopular. And somebody might be saying, boy, I'm glad I didn't invite any friends to come tonight to hear this most unloving sermon that's ever been preached hope that's not your reaction and I hope that my that my um, passion has not gotten in the way of what the Bible says but if the Bible says something then we need to teach what the Bible says but if you think this is a serious topic you are in good company look at Matthew chapter 19 when the disciples heard what Jesus had to say about marriage divorce and remarriage they realized how serious this was, how narrow this was, and they said, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry.
They weren't saying they weren't ever going to get married and that nobody should ever get married, but they were saying, wow, if this is how serious it is, we'd better take it seriously. And we'd better not jump into some marriage without considering all that God has to say about this subject. He's the one who created marriage. He's the one who regulates marriage. And may we never be ones who would turn away from the will of God in order to serve the will of me. As you think about this topic, sometimes somebody says, well, don't I have a right to be happy? Doesn't God want me to be happy? And I've had people to tell me that when we've talked about this subject. Well, God wants me to be happy. And so I'm going to go and marry this other person who in God's eyes I don't have a right to be married to. Can you look at the last line on the screen? If I go and marry somebody who I don't have a right to be married to, adultery is not a one-person sin. I am committing the sin of adultery, and now I am causing the person that I am married to to be committing the sin of adultery. God just wants me to be happy. Am I willing to not just jeopardize my soul? Am I willing to jeopardize the soul of a person that I supposedly love by causing them to commit the same sin that I'm committing? That's how serious this subject is. Fornicators and adulterers, the Bible says God's going to judge. May God help us to just stand where He stands. May I say again, this lesson isn't designed to look at any one person or target anybody in this congregation. It's to remind us of the seriousness of this subject in the eyes of God. As you think about serious subjects in the eyes of God, salvation is a serious subject in the eyes of God. So serious that when man sinned, God already had a plan to take care of it, to send His Son to save us from our sins. And He gave us a plan in His Word in order to be saved. And you know what that plan is. You've heard it over and over. But without shame, we tell it in every assembly of this church. That in order to be right with God, you've got to believe that Jesus is God's Son. You've got to get right with God. And that starts by recognizing that He sent His Son to die on that cross for my sins. That He was buried and He was raised from the, dra from the grave the third day. Do you believe that? Does that cause you to have godly sorrow? That's what it's designed to do. It's designed to prick you in your heart like those in Acts chapter 2. They were pricked in their heart when they realized what Jesus had done for them. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent, he says. That's your next step. Change the way you're thinking. Change the way you're living in order to change the direction of your life. And if you're ready to make that decision tonight, you can do what they did in the New Testament. Confess the faith that you have in Jesus. Be baptized for the remission of all of your sins. To be raised to walk a new life in service to him. If you've never done that, why don't you do that tonight? Why don't you get your life right with Him tonight? The song we're going to sing says there's a fountain that's free. And it's His for you and me. If you're not right with God, why don't you come to that fountain? Let the blood of Jesus wash away your sins tonight as together we stand and sing.